Today's show is brought to you by the Pittsburgh Dance Council, a project of the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. For more than 50 years, the Pittsburgh Dance Council has been bringing world-class contemporary dance performances to downtown, and the new season looks so fun. We're talking folks from Taiwan, Cuba, Mexico, France, LA, and New York, and tickets are available now for the upcoming season. Plus, we've got a special offer for CityCast Pittsburgh listeners. Use promo code DANCECAST for 30% off your tickets. The deal is only good through this Sunday, October 13th, so visit Visit trustarts.org slash dance to get your seats now. Pittsburgh Opera presents Puccini's Tosca, October 5th through 13th. Claudia Tosca must free her lover from the clutches of a corrupt police chief. This whirlwind thriller packs romance, dark motives, betrayal, murder, and intrigue into a plot that will keep you on the edge of your seat. See why Tosca is one of the most powerful operas ever. Learn more at pittsburghopera.org slash Tosca. Pittsburgh Opera, where can we take you? Today on CityCast Pittsburgh. We're a tech city known for everything from robotics to self-driving cars. But as a devoted gamer, I'd love to see us become a hotspot for video games. And it turns out my dream isn't all that far away. I'm with a reporter who's been looking into Pittsburgh's role in video game development and how these new studios are bringing retro games back in style. Plus, there's one local game that has lots of Easter eggs for diehard Pittsburghers. It's Monday, October 7th. I'm Sophia Lowe, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with Colin Deppin, a newsletter editor and writer at Spotlight PA. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk about video games with you. I'm a huge video game fan, but before reading your reporting, I had no idea that Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh are kind of like vying to become industry hubs. Can you give us a sense of what the video game landscape looks like here in the state? Yeah, sure. It is uh, relatively small at the moment, Uh, certainly nowhere on the order of a a big developing hotspot like California, even Montreal, Austin, Texas. Right. Uh, but it's growing. And certainly the state has taken steps to, to <laughs> ensure that growth as much as possible um, via you know, tax credits for the industry that, that, you know, they've maxed out several years running. Mm-hmm. Could you explain a little bit more about how that tax credit situation works? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the tax credit is a video game production tax credit. There are other tax credits that, that you know, your average video game developer could access, but this one is, is sort of tailor-made for the industry. Uh, it launched in 2016, mm-hmm. so and since then has awarded upwards of $6 million in credits to, to some 32 combined Whoa. recipients and, and maxed out the, the $1 million budget allocation five years running. Is there any talk of expanding that budget since we're consistently maxing it out? There, certainly within the industry, for years, developers have said m- mm. much more is needed on this front. They, they see it as a difference maker, uh, and they, they want to grow the ranks here as well. Uh, so far, it remains capped at a million, uh, but certainly there has been talk about, about raising that threshold. Yeah. And, you know, kind of coming a little more locally here in Pittsburgh, we've got quite a few studios. What makes our city especially an ideal spot to start up a video game studio? Yeah, it's a great question. And and it really boils down to to a couple factors. Uh, Colleges, we have many here. And and sort of this pipeline, this steady stream of graduates with backgrounds in art and or technology, which is a, a perfect sweet spot for the game development industry. Uh, and it remains relatively affordable, especially compared with you know some of those larger video game development markets like San Francisco, uh, for example. So af- affordability uh, and, and certainly colleges are big reasons that that Pittsburgh is you know as as thick with video game developers as it is. And I know you said we're still pretty small, but could we ever become the next big game dev hub? Should we even want to be? <laughs> that that may be the question. Uh, you know, there, there are some folks within the industry here who are very bullish 
um, and, and would say absolutely yes to that to that question. Um, I, certainly, developers say you know more tax credits from the state would help mm-hmm. the, the industry. The industry, yeah, absolutely, and and the industry is growing sort of you know leaps and bounds all the time. Uh, so there is there is a, some sort of natural trickle down there, but I, I think it's really important to ask the question: Would we want that kind of growth? Uh, certainly, you've seen in other you know tech market hot spots, uh, uh, you know a lot of pressure around housing markets affordability. Yeah. So that really may be the question long term. Um, you know, if if any sort of sustainable significant growth is to happen, what would those ripple effects be? Totally. I'm just thinking like Pittsburgh, tech, all that stuff, like video games seems like a pretty natural offshoot. Um, But I also want to talk about the sort of video games that are currently produced in Pittsburgh. Is there any sort of niche that the game devs here are filling? Yeah, I mean, I think per capita, we have a a relatively high number of retro game developers. Fun. And they're pretty, it's, you know, the the offerings are diverse. Most companies do a little bit of this and a little bit of that as opposed to, to just one solitary approach. Uh, there's Mega Cat Studios, uh, you know, retrotainment gaming. There's Shell Games. We have quite a number of of firms here, given the size of the city. And certainly, as you know, Pittsburgh has really tried, especially in the last decade or so, to lean into this sort of this tech market. And we've got mm-hmm. AI, we've got robotics, we've had self-driving cars here. So it does feel germane uh, that Pittsburgh, of all places, certainly within Pennsylvania, would have you know, a relatively high share of game development happening here. And backing up, can you just explain a little more about what you mean by retro games? Like as a Gen Z, I'm assuming my retro games might feel a little bit different (laughs) than what these companies are producing. Yeah. So retro games typically will, will, you know, is used to refer to games with a a two dimensional uh, graphic system, a more linear gameplay than what you might see in the big blockbuster releases of today, like Elden Ring or Starfield, which are just kind of infinite. You can go in any direction, almost as far as you want, it feels. Totally. So a very different sort of pared down version of, of, of a video game by, by contemporary standards, but also worth noting that uh, retro games are by no means easy. They are some of the most challenging games out there. So it might be a bit of a misconception that just because they're simpler, they're, they're, they're easier to, to beat, which, which they are. So why retro games? Like, who's the target audience for that? I think naturally you'd assume it's it's people like myself, without dating myself too too, <laughs> too much, um, who grew up playing retro games, and and you know they are nostalgic, they are comforting, they remind us of you know our, our childhoods, and then it's very much a part of it. But I think the surprising thing about the popularity of retro games is is it's also young people who you know were nowhere near born at the time of, of the original release of a lot of these consoles and games uh, who have really taken to them. And I think that is about simplicity, the simplicity of the games in this age of really like hyper-realistic digital content. Uh, you know, it, it, they, these games look and, and feel novel again, because mm-hmm. in many ways they are. They're such a departure from, from the big releases and the Xbox consoles and the Playstations. Uh, in April, The Guardian reported that the retro gaming hashtag, uh, you know, had amassed over 6 billion views on videos on TikTok. Whoa. YouTube uploads were up a thousand fold since 2007. Spotify users have upped their creation of playlists with throwback retro game music. So, and there's really some data behind this. This is, this is certainly, is certainly having a moment, a cultural moment. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. With Halloween just around the corner, some of us have been thinking about masks, you know, playing a part, doing it for the bit, but pretending to be someone else should be for fun, not for our emotions. If you feel like you've been overwhelmed and you've been trying to put on a brave face, maybe therapy can help. And I've been to therapy and it's really nice to have someone to talk to without burdening your partner or your family or friends who, let's be honest, they love you to pieces, but can be out of their depth when you're clearly struggling with something and need a better outlet for those feelings. And sometimes just getting started can be the hardest part. 
BetterHelp can make finding someone so much easier. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched to a licensed therapist. The care is entirely online, so it's flexible to fit your busy schedule. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash CityCast today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash CityCast. Hi, this is David Plotz of CityCast. Have you thought about a gift for yourself this year? One that has the power to help you grow and learn and become a better version of yourself? Give yourself the gift of language by getting Babbel. With quick 10-minute lessons handcrafted by language experts, Babbel gets you talking a new language in three weeks because talking is the key to really knowing a language. And that's how Babbel approaches it. It's designed for real conversation. So I have a trip to France planned with my girlfriend. Was it inspired by the Olympics? Yes, it was. And it's given me the chance to revive my old high school French. And it's so fun to catch back up with the vocabulary I'd forgotten, to remember all the food, for example. I'm in a lesson on ingredients, so I'm going to make crepes with butter and sugar. Avec sucre et de beurre salé, on va se régaler. We're going to have a feast. They learned this great new French expression, too. J'en ai l'eau à la bouche. That means I have water in the mouth. That means it's mouth-watering. Love it. Love French. Anyway, Babbel gets you talking, and studies from Yale and Michigan State University and other leading universities prove that it works. So here is a special holiday deal for CityCast listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for CityCast listeners at babbel.com slash citycast. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash citycast, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash citycast. Rules and restrictions may apply. Do you think there's anything about Pittsburgh that makes us a good fit for retro games? Because I'm thinking like we're pretty nostalgic as a city. I feel like I've also seen like pinball machines and stuff. Is that why (laughs) it's coming here? Like, is there anything about our demographic? I, I think I think the growth of retro game development here, or, or maybe the, the foothold of retro game development here, owes more to some of those factors like relative affordability, okay. uh, you know, the, the arts colleges, the technology schools here. But I, I do love the the idea that maybe there's in this city that's so associated with like a vintage aesthetic um, that there would be this like this sort of natural proclivity towards you know <laughs> retro game playing retro game development yes i'm, I'm gonna say why not let's let's go with that just a little theory <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> so for people who are maybe interested in trying these or returning to games that feel familiar what kind of equipment do you need do i have to like dig around and hope an old gamecube works is this a remaster situation do i need a cartridge because i'm gonna be honest almost everything i own is a digital download because i cannot keep track of a physical game card yeah, I'm in the I'm in the same boat. Um, you can do a couple things here. You certainly can do it the really old school way with an old fashioned console, with you know an older television set that has like RCA plugs in in the background. Or in, I don't in the- know what that is. I have a smart TV. <laughs> I, I continue to date myself in in the course of this interview, but um, nonetheless, yes, there, there. I mean, there are lots of ways to do it. But as some of these developers told me in the course of reporting this story. Uh, you know, they really found themselves hitting a ceiling when it came to making games purely for cartridge enthusiasts, which is more of a kind of a collector's market mm-hmm, and, and a really, yeah, and a relatively small share of, of overall sales. They realized they were hitting a ceiling. They were maxing out that, that audience. So many have trans transferred or translated their games, their retro games beyond cartridges to, to mobile phones, to, to other digital uh, devices just to to reach a much, much larger audience in the process. Yeah, I'm glad they're doing a little bit of both. Like personally, I'm not huge into collecting video games, but I do have a lot of other little trinkets and there is something special about having like that physical form of media. I, I must say a couple of years ago, I dug an old Nintendo 64 out of my mother's attic in North Central Pennsylvania. And I proceeded to play those games back to front and I, I did. I really, I really appreciated having that sort of tangible copy. It was such a departure. It was kind of nice. I do like playing things like very physically too. If holding mm-hmm. a console in my hand still feels very different than looking at like a TV. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm curious whether your reporting also included the opportunity to play any of these locally made video games. What do you think? It it did not, unfortunately. Oh but, no. But I have I have tried some games 
uh, some retro games. Uh, and I must say, I go, they are hard. They are hard. It, it's it's a bit deceptive. You think, oh, these older games must have been so much easier. They they really they really weren't. To to the point a minute ago about digging, you know, the Nintendo sixty four to my mother's attic. Those games vexed me. They they were difficult to to get through. You know, all these years later. Um, so, so I, again, just a, a, a word of caution for anyone, you know, excited to pick up a retro game. Don't expect it to be, uh, you know, uh, easy, necessarily easy process. Mm -hmm. I did try checking out Coffee Crisis. That's from Mega Cat Studios. You are a barista fighting aliens. Um, and it wasn't that easy. I mean, I haven't played a ton of it yet, so maybe I'll get great in the next couple days. But uh, I thought it was really fun. There's a character named Yinzer, and there's also like a shot where you're looking at Black Forge Coffee, yeah. which is now Grim Wizard. But I love the little Easter eggs. Like you could still totally enjoy the game knowing nothing about Pittsburgh. But if you're from the area or lived here, I do really like that you do feel that sense of like, oh, this was made in my city. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I love those little nods to, to you know, the, the territory, so to speak. And then looking forward a little bit, game dev can take a very long time. Uh, have any of these Pittsburgh companies shared, you know, some of their goals or what they hope to be doing over the next few years? Yeah, uh, you know, obviously, Bruce is is the name of the game. Um, you know, they keep adding staff. They they keep you know coming up with new games. Shell Games is very very busy in the in the VR space and in, in the virtual reality market. So obviously, there is a lot of uh, room for iteration there. Uh, I think I, I've talked to a couple who said that we're going to go for state tax credits for the first time. So all of that, I think, is is in the mix as as these companies in this industry continue to expand their their local foothold. Absolutely. And just to end on something fun, uh, if you were going to design a video game set in Pittsburgh, what would it be? This is a good one. It has to be something driving related. <laughs> because <laughs> it is it is the most vexing, frustrating part of Pittsburgh for me often. Um, yeah, I think I would do a driving related game, um, taking over like 376 for illicit streetcar racing or something. I'm thinking like streetcar racing, like over a bridge. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Some drag strip just over the, <laughs> over the ninth street. <laughs> Absolutely. I do not drive, but you know, Pittsburgh video game, I would try driving there. I think that's a good place to, you know, get my feet wet. Yes, if, if I could think of a, of a mass transit related video game premise, I, I think that would be fun too. <laughs> Might take a little more time. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll see something like that in action. Colin Deppin is a newsletter editor and writer for Spotlight PA, and we will drop a link to his reporting on retro video games in our show notes. Colin, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. A huge thank you to everyone who became members during our fall membership campaign. We could not do this without our members and we appreciate y'all so much. And even though our membership campaign is over, you can still show us that extra love. You can sign up for our membership program and support us at membership.citycast.fm. There are so many great perks. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. I am currently um, very deep in a couple of, of games, Elden Ring being one, um, which again is this, this example of this just massive open world. Huge. Huge, really it, it sort of remarkably large. Um, open world, uh, Lies of P is really fun for anyone who enjoys that sort of combat style of game. Um, and there's a couple really fun like puzzle ones. I think there's one called Humanity, which you guide this like almost fluid water-like stream of human beings through Ooh. these complicated um, sort of like geometric puzzles. Uh, there's so much happening in video games. It's almost impossible to keep up with new releases. Uh, so it is a great time to be a video game enthusiast.